Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to stay up here. Uh, I'm at the point where I have to refer to my notes or I forget things. So. And, and I print them out in very large type so that I can see uh, with my aging eyes. Uh, and uh, so I'm, uh, I'll stay put right here. Uh, let's see. I think I'll put the microphone over here. Okay. Uh, I want to start by thanking Dr. Rodriguez Sayardo and the program committee here at UNAM for inviting me. It's really an honor to be a part of this uh, conference. Uh, and I'm looking forward to learning a great deal and hope that what I contributed may be of help to some of you in the audience. Uh, I've already learned a great deal this morning from Dr. Weinberger's presentation, as well as the comments of my colleagues on the panel. As a matter of fact, uh, in a sense, uh, my remarks will be something of a follow-on uh, to those of uh, Dr. Alvarado. Uh, our, our, our presentations, I think, uh, uh, dovetail nicely uh, and uh, that's without any kind of communication. So either that means that there was a you know, remarkable uh, exchange of brainwaves going on between the U.S. and Chile, uh, or, uh, or perhaps it is that in fact uh, internationally in our societies around the world we are experiencing similar phenomena and responding and, and leading those phenomena. So uh, this is actually not a presentation about technology. Uh, it's not that I disagree with the uh, role that others have described already for technology, but I believe that there's a human element that must be present and it is that human element that is my particular focus. Indeed, uh, Dr. Alvarado talked about the human capital, and uh, I think that's uh, a critical uh, point that, that I want to follow up with. She also mentioned the report that uh, described embedding information literacy in the curriculum as a solvable ch challenge, and I agree with that. I want to talk about that very uh, specifically. Uh, and uh, although it's a solvable challenge, it does not mean that it's going to happen by itself. That in fact, for that solution to be implemented, it takes the leadership of library managers, directors, and staff, all of us in the room. And uh, so I want to share some thoughts about how that implementation can be led. So, uh, I have a simple thesis this morning. It goes like this. Library services have changed. I want to talk about how those services have changed. Uh, secondly, that because the services have changed, the nature of the roles and the skills of library staff are changing. Then, because the nature of library work has been changing, library management practices must also change. Traditional library managers, I believe, management practices, I believe, are becoming less and less effective in the new conditions, and we must introduce innovations there. Specifically, I'll get into four management changes. The first is that the roles and skills needed in academic library public services, particularly, mean that the positions of librarians must be redefined. There's a new category of public service positions that no longer requires an advanced education in librarianship. At the same time, there are emerging roles for librarians that utilize the competencies 
in new ways and emphasize outreach, initiative, and greater participation across organizational teams with subject instructors. Next, supervisory practices appropriate to a traditional organizational and service model must give way to new practices based on the idea advanced by Peter Drucker, who said that knowledge workers cannot be supervised closely or in detail. They can only be helped. And so the question becomes, how do we help those library public services knowledge workers? And I think one of the key elements of that is that library managers must themselves engage in outreach and collaboration. They must lead from the front by establishing stronger relationships with their management counterparts in other parts of the academic institution. And then finally, and this was brought up previously as well, the use of measures of impact and merit or value must be included prominently along with traditional measures of inputs and outputs in evaluating our services. Now, pause for a moment. Uh, I want to discuss the theory of disruption advanced by Clayton Christensen. How many of you are familiar with this theory? Just, just a handful, so, so uh, hopefully this will be helpful. So Christensen uh, at the Harvard Business School uh, has developed this theory in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and in many other writings. Disruption occurs when an innovation cheaper and less functional than established products and services becomes good enough to draw customers away from those established sources. The innovative upstart then continues to improve and to offer superior value, while the established entity fails to adjust and compete. In the extreme case, the formerly dominant source disappears. It's completely replaced by the former upstart. Now, the changes that have been taking place in academic library public services bear many of the characteristics of Christensen's theory of disruption. This, the, the disruptors have been technological, largely the internet and the World Wide Web. Library efforts to compete directly against these disruptors, I would argue, have not been very successful. But our response has actually not conformed to Christensen's theory in all respects. What we are, in fact, doing is adopting new, higher value services, which uh, is an area in which the disruptors are not competing. So, the evidence is mounting of the disruption and change in library public services, particularly in academic libraries. This morning I'll give you one example of the magnitude of this change. This comes from the Association of Research Libraries, or ARL. ARL is a consortium of over 120 of the largest academic and research libraries in Canada and the United States. One of its functions is to collect and analyze statistics from its member libraries. This graph shows two key indicators reported by ARL members between 1991 and 2012. These two metrics are the metrics that show the greatest declines during the period of any of the metrics reported. The greatest decline of all has been in the number of reference questions. Reference questions are down 69% during the 20-year period. Think of if McDonald's was selling 69% fewer hamburgers, or Pizza Hut was selling 69% fewer.
fewer pizzas. They wouldn't be in business. The next greatest decline has occurred in initial circulation. The borrowing of physical materials from the libraries, which is down 44% in the same period. Note that both of these numbers helped steady and grew somewhat through most of the 1990s and only collapsed around the year 2000, which closely coincides with the expansion of the popular use of the internet, the founding of Google in September 1998, and the increasing use of digital content. This is classic disruption. The internet, search engines, digital content, all of which were met with significant resistance and disdain by many in the librarianship profession, became the source of first resort for internet users and caused, or at least coincided, but I would argue there's good reason to suppose that there may be a causal relationship the drop of these traditional library services. Now, there's another trend. At the same time that reference and circulation statistics were falling precipitously, another interesting trend developed. Other services, specifically instructional services, were growing even more rapidly. Instructions was represented here by two separate metrics. The number of attendees at group presentations conducted by libraries and the number of such presentations held. The number of presentations has grown by 81%. I think if McDonald's sold 81% more numbers. And the number of attendees reported has grown by 144%. Now, while we don't know the details of the nature of all of these presentations, it seems reasonable to suppose that much of this growth is related to the rise of concern with information literacy. In other words, it appears that librarians are keeping busy no longer answering questions at the reference desk, by teaching information literacy. So, together these metrics from the Association of Research Libraries paint a picture of dramatic change in library services. There's been a devastating disruption of traditional services and the response in effect, not always with strategic vision, I would argue, but in effect has been dramatically repositioning services to emphasize instructional presentations. So that's what's been happening. Now let's turn to the four management challenge, challenges and changes that are driven by this. The first one, library service positions must be redefined. As we've seen, traditional subject reference questions in university libraries decline dramatically. The predominant types of questions now asked of library public services staff are directional and technical. You know, where is this? How do I make the printer work? Kind of like the, uh, the monk with the help desk. Uh, it doesn't require advanced education in librarianship to answer these types of questions. On the other hand, the demand for librarians to teach information literacy has decreased dramatically. Effective teaching demands that highly qualified librarians add new skills to their set of competencies. I'll say more about what these new skills are in a moment. But for now, I'd simply point out that this indicates a split and two new types of library public services positions that I would argue are emerging. One does not require advanced education in librarianship. It provides basic services to those individuals who are using the library's physical space. 
The other requires highly developed librarianship skills and has little to do with staff in the facility. It has everything to do with outreach and instruction. The staffing of these positions requires difficult change, especially in the no growth environment that many of us face. However, there are ways to accomplish it. One is to shift staff from tasks that are no longer as time consuming to new service roles. Now, library knowledge workers, the second change, library knowledge workers cannot be supervised closely or in detail. They can only be helped. So I'd like to focus on those librarians who are engaged in outreach and instruction. First, I want to discuss why outreach and instruction is so important. We've learned that effective instruction addresses multiple learning styles. It reinforces lecture with observation, experimentation, and practice. It scaffolds lessons so that advanced skill development is based on a foundation of basic skills. In short, we've learned that the best instruction is not delivered as a standalone, one-shot lecture. It consists of a variety of learning activities with specific goals, and it's customized to a specific course and subject discipline. In this way, students have the opportunity to use and practice the skills that librarians are teaching. Further, we've discovered that librarians can only integrate or embed information literacy instruction into courses and subjects when they collaborate with course instructors. This means librarians must first establish strong collaborative working relationships with instructors in order to infuse those information skills into the curriculum. That's how this solvable challenge, I believe, actually gets implemented. This is the origin of the idea. Catching up here. This is the origin of the idea that librarians will work increasingly across organizational teams. Ultimately, we'll find that there are opportunities beyond course embedded teaching, but there isn't time. I'm not going to explore those uh, at this point. Uh, instead, for a truly broad vision of the potential of librarians to participate fully in the life of higher education, I refer you to one article. It's an old article, 2004, by Barbara Dewey, entitled The Embedded Librarian Strategic Campus Collaborations. But the key question for managers will be, how do we manage staff whose work leads them to spend much of their time out of the library, engaged in work that's a new variety of knowledge work that's not measured by our traditional measures? And the answer is that, I believe, of Peter Drucker, who notes that supervisors must become the facilitators and those who enable the employee's success and shifts away from traditional approaches to direction and control. So this leads us to the next management change, which is library managers becoming relationship managers. So how do academic library managers actually help librarians in outreach and instruction? There are indications from my own research on embedded librarianship. And the answer, I believe, is they become relationship managers themselves. One of the insights is when a library manager gathers together the library reference staff and says, now you will become all embedded librarians and you will go forth and establish relationships with subject respect instructors and infuse the curriculum with information literacy. A few will succeed and most will fail. The way that 
success comes about is when the library management and the academic subject management share commitment to the collaboration between librarians and subject instructors. And what this means is that library managers have to be out establishing those collaborative relationships with their management counterparts, the heads of schools, uh, departments, and so forth. Last one. Oh, we never got to this subject. So library managers themselves must be coordinators, marketers, and negotiators. Okay, last point on measures of impact and value. The old measures have dealt with collection size, budgets, activity counts. The ARL has showed us a level of uh, innovative or um, value-oriented measurement in terms of tracking uh, interactions with the, the community the library serves. And these metrics are still of use, but they're not sufficient to demonstrate the role of the library in the current environment. So instead, we need things like anecdotes of librarians' contributions to university teaching and research missions. We need to show, and Dr. Alvarado showed this in her discussion of data mining examples, impacts of the library on student performance. So can we demonstrate that information literacy instruction effectively delivered in the student's first year will lead to improved academic success over the course of that student's academic career? And we do have some evidence to that effect. So a few libraries have begun to develop these kinds of indicators. So, in conclusion, uh, so far I haven't said anything about innovation. So I want to just take a moment, since that was promised in the title, and say just a word. Because I think that, like Drucker's comment that knowledge workers can only be helped, I think that innovation emerges from the right context. And so uh, I think that as libraries collaborate more fully in the academic community, we will continue to see innovations in the way that knowledge work is conducted. So the focus of my remarks has been on the management of knowledge work and innovation in libraries. The changes of the past 25 years have both disrupted traditional operations and given librarians a new opportunity to become more valuable to their academic communities. In order to exploit this community, solvable it is, but it won't solve itself, librarians must work differently than in the past, and managers must make important changes in library staffing and in their own priorities. The fact is, we can achieve effective knowledge work, and we can innovate if we try to do these things on our own. We can only do them in partnership with the members of the communities to which we belong. Thank you.